Good day. Over the last few uh, weeks, especially since the disastrous US-China summit in Anchorage, disastrous to the United States, I should say, we have seen a flurry of articles appearing in the uh, English language media which have been discussing the possibility of a Chinese military attack on Taiwan intended to capture the island and to bring it under Chinese mainland control. I would add that these articles, which have been appearing in many places now, seem to be sourced or rather um, inspired by senior officials within the United States government. An article which appeared in the Financial Times on 27th March 2021 is a typical example. Um, I will uh, start by quoting its title, which is actually quite on ominous. It reads, US fears China is flirting with seizing control of Taiwan. And when we go to the body of the article itself, we find numerous quotes, both anonymously sourced and also public, from various US administration officials. Now, it begins, the article begins with a quote from an official who we are told is a senior US official who spoke to the Financial Times. Now, that leads me to think, by the way, that this article is, is actually inspired by that particular official. In other words, this is an article which the US government, the Biden administration, has itself planted and which appears in the Financial Times precisely because this US official has been talking to the, to, to the Financial Times along the lines that I'm just going to say. So this is what the Financial Times quotes this US official as saying. China appears to be moving from a period of being content with the status quo over Taiwan to a period in which they are more impatient and more prepared to test the limits and flirt with the idea of unification. As we prepare for a period in which Xi Jinping will likely be entering his third term, there's concern that he sees capstone progress on Taiwan as important to his legitimacy and legacy. It seems that he is prepared to take more risks. And the Financial Times goes on to say that the official said that the Biden administration had reached the conclusion after assessing Chinese behaviour during the past two months. And then, following on from this quote from an anonymous official, we have a cascade of, of quotes from various US military officials which have been made in public. Uh, in public. So we begin with Ad Admiral Philip Davison, who the Financial Times tells us is the head of the US Indo-Pacific Command. He, he apparently told the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that China could take military action in the next six years. His, in, uh, his uh, successor, or his scheduled successor, Admiral Joe Aquilino, is then quoted uh, as telling uh, the um, Senate, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, that though there is a wide range of forecasts about what the Chinese might do, my opinion is this problem is much closer to us than most think. Um, um, Aquilino, according to the Financial Times, said that China had taken other aggressive actions, including clashes with India on their border, that suggested it was emboldened. We've seen things that I don't think we expected, Aquilino told the Senate Armed Services Committee. That's why I continue to talk about a sense of urgency. We ought to be prepared today. Then we have another quote, this time from another US official, 
who um, ha, um, is speaking on the record. Uh, this time it's Kurt Campbell, a top White House Asia official who spoke to the Financial Times and says that, and who apparently told the Financial Times that China was acting in an increasingly aggressive manner in many areas, but it was taking its most assertive actions in its reproach to Taiwan. And the Financial Times quotes Kurt Campbell as saying, We have seen China become increasingly assertive in the South China Sea, economic coercion against Australia, wolf warrior diplomacy in Europe, and the border tensions with India. But nowhere have we seen more persistent and determined activities than the military, diplomatic and other activities directed at Taiwan. And then we also have, uh, following on from all these quotes from US officials, quotes from Taiwanese officials, specifically from Alexander Huang, who is a former deputy chair of the Mainland Affairs Council, Taiwan's cabinet-level China policy body, who the Financial Times says, uh, uh, spoke in this way, that, that there was a crazy perception gap and that the situation was dangerous. Um, having said which, I go back to what I said initially. My imp clear impression is that this entire article was inspired by that uh, uh, senior U.S. official who spoke to the United States, uh, to the Financial Times, anonymously, and who, by the way, I suspect was either Secretary of State Antony Blinken or possibly someone close to him. I say that because at the end of this article, there is a long discussion about um, comments that Blinken made to the Chinese at the summit in Anchorage, which seem to have little connection to the topic of Taiwan, but seem to point to him specifically as the major interlocutor of US policy with China. And that seems to me to be intended as a broad hint that he is the person who the Financial Times either spoke to and who it quoted at the beginning of the article, or someone close to him. Now, is, it, is any of this true? Is China really planning over the next few years or weeks or months to attack Taiwan? And is this really part of Xi Jinping's policies? Well, I'm going to sp express straight away my own deep scepticism. Firstly, I'm going to say a few things about Xi Jinping himself, because I noticed that there is a growing tendency on the part of sections of the Western media and um, on the part of Western governments to attribute all that is going wrong in China, going wrong, I should stress, from a Western point of view, to Xi Jinping himself. Um, supposedly, Xi Jinping has established himself as the most powerful Chinese leader since the death of Mao Zedong. He is supposedly taking a more repressive policy within China itself and a more aggressive policy on the part of China internationally. And these moves against Taiwan are simply an expression of that. And I go back to uh, that, 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 those points made by that anonymous official about how Xi Jinping supposedly is looking to achieve some kind of breakthrough over the question of Taiwan in order to consolidate uh, his control as he moves towards his third term and in order to establish his legitimacy and legacy, as the article says, as the anonymous, as the article quotes, the anonymous official has said, uh, report, it reports, as the Financial Times reports, the anonymous, the anonymous official is saying, and that uh, Xi Jinping is supposedly prepared to take more risks. All of this, by the way, reminds me of an article, or rather a long report, that appeared a short time ago, on the website of the Atlantic Council, also sourced to an anonymous official, quite possibly, very probably, in fact, 
the same anonymous official who has been speaking to the Financial Times, in which uh, that anonymous official talks about the challenge from China in lurid terms and again attributes it all to the uh, policies and intentions and plans of Xi Jinping. So is any of this true? Does this make any kind of sense? Is this really what the Chinese are doing? Well, I think a few points to make, first of all, about Xi Jinping himself. Firstly, I absolutely do not agree with this idea that Xi Jinping uh, has actually carried out any radical break in Chinese domestic or foreign policies. On the contrary, there is a clear continuum between what Xi Jinping did and what his predecessors, Jiang Zemin and Hu Tsintao, was, were doing. The only reason why there is this enormous emphasis on Xi Jinping is because the United States has, for various reasons, come to perceive a greater challenge from China since roughly the time when he became president. And that inevitably has focused attention on Xi Jinping because he has been China's leader during that period. In addition, I have to say that I take strong, uh, I, I express my strong disagreement with the claim that Xi Jinping is the most powerful leader China has had since the death of Mao Zedong. The most powerful leader China had following the death of uh, Mao Zedong was not, is not Xi Jinping. It was Deng Xiaoping who became China's leader at the end of the 1970s and who led China through the massive reform program that took place in the 1980s and early 1990s. Deng Xiaoping belonged to that great generation, as the Chinese would say, of revolutionary leaders who created the People's Republic in the 1940s, and he had, as a result, an authority and charisma within China and within the Chinese Communist Party, which Xi Jinping and no other Chinese leader uh, um, um, since Deng Xiaoping's death can remotely match. Um, it is true that Xi Jinping is an affable and popular leader. When I visited China in 2017, I noted how generally popular he appeared to be. But this, uh, this claim that he is some kind of um, you know, autocrat or dictator and that his will in China is law is simply wrong, and in my opinion, wrong to the point of being ridiculous. Having said that, it is undoubtedly the case that the Chinese do care a great deal about Taiwan. And this is a point that I need, I think needs some discussion. Briefly, between roughly 1840 and the, and the formation of the People's Republic in um, 1949, China went through an intense, prolonged crisis as a period of dynastic change with the fall of the uh, decline and fall of the Qing dynasty um, uh, took place simultaneously with increasing aggression by outside powers against China. As a result, large territories of China, of China were taken from it. The Chinese uh, uh, Western powers established a uh, settlement in Shanghai. There were various uh, bases um, um, controlled by Western governments in places like uh, Tsingdao, which was controlled by the Germans. The uh, British gained control of Hong Kong. And, of course, the Japanese launched all kinds of attacks on China, which culminated in a massive war launched by Ch Japan against China in the 1930s. All of this took place during a period of economic collapse, political strife, massive division, and also civil war. The Russians often talk about 
the terrible crisis Russia experienced during the decade of the 1990s. For the Chinese nation, the period before the creation of the People's Republic, uh, the century before, was an entire century like the, 19, the decade of the 1990s was for Russia. So obviously, and entirely unsurprisingly, the entire focus of Chinese policy today, and indeed of the Chinese nation today, is to bring China back, to correct all the problems that took place over that period, to re-establish China as a st strong, stable, prosperous country, and to unite China again, and to have one China um, at peace within itself, and also strong enough to repel any similar pressure from the outside powers. Now, Taiwan remains a piece of unfinished business from this period. Of from this period. The uh, government that, that is in control of Taiwan was formed in 1950 when uh, the Guomindang government, led by the then Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek, having been defeated by Mao Zedong and the communists in the Chinese Civil War, fled to Taiwan and established themselves there as the government of China. They were recognized as such by the United States, and for uh, decades, they actually held China's seat in the United Nations and in the UN Security Council. Um, I would add that before Chiang Kai-shek fled Beijing, he took with him all the great treasures of um, the Imperial Palace, the Forbidden City, and established in the uh, Taiwanese capital, Taipei, um, a, the Palace Museum, where many of the greatest treasures of Chinese art can to this day be found. So initially and originally, this was a government in Taiwan which claimed that it was the true legitimate government of China, and which for decades was backed as that government by the United States and by many of the Western powers. Now, in the 1970s, as we all know, the United States and China began a long process of rapprochement that led to the United States recognizing China as uh, uh, the Chinese government in Beijing, as the true government of China, it led to the United States downgrading its uh, uh, recognition of the government in Taiwan, and perhaps predictably and unsurprisingly, that led in turn to the government in Taiwan and to the people of Taiwan uh, starting to think themselves increasingly as a separate political and economic and social entity from China. Now, I'm not going to dis you know, d discuss the rights and wrongs of this affair. All I would say is that it is perhaps unsurprising that there have been, there's been a growth in sentiment in Taiwan uh, seeking independence, outright independence, or if you prefer, a, a break, a formal break from China. And there is also, it is completely unsurprising, that within China itself, this is strongly resisted, not just by the Chinese government, not just by Ch Xi Jinping, but by the entire Chinese nation, which sees the loss of Taiwan in this sort of way as um, perpetuating the disastrous legacy of that appalling legacy of a crisis that took place during that century of division and collapse and aggression and humiliation, which the Chinese people had to endure between 18, the 1840s and the formation of the People's Republic 
in the 1940s. So it is inevitable that the Chinese will oppose any moves towards independence by Taiwan and China being overwhelmingly the most powerful country in this region with a mighty military, it is unsurprising that the Chinese from time to time take, make military demonstrations um, along, China, along Taiwan's seacoast and um, speak about their willingness and readiness to use force to bring Taiwan back into China if that should ever prove necessary. There is nothing new in any of this. Certainly, Xi Jinping has not initiated any of it. The United States has always been aware of this and has always known about it. And it knew that this was the case long before Xi Jinping became president of China. Um, indeed, it was implicit in all the steps the United States took ever since it began its rapprochement with China in the 1970s. So nothing new between China and Taiwan in terms of Chinese ultimate objectives and nothing new in terms of China's willingness and expressed, I would add, publicly expressed willingness to use force um, to bring Taiwan back under Chinese control if that is what is needed. I would, however, qualify all this by making certain further uh, observations. Firstly, though the Chinese will never accept Taiwanese independence, and secession from China, and have always said that they would be prepared to use force to bring Taiwan back into China, they've also repeatedly made it clear that that is not their preferred uh, 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 approach to this question. Instead, China has consistently sought negotiations with Taiwan with a view to a peaceful reunification between Taiwan and the rest of China. That has always been China's uh, primary policy. And as far as I can see, it remains the primary policy to this day. Um, if the situation were different, if the situation were peaceful, in the Asia-Pacific region, um, I am sure that China would still be placing all the focus on, in its Taiwan policy, on achieving that change which it seeks through a combination of diplomatic and economic outreach to Taiwan, which, to be very clear, has in the past received some positive response from Taiwan. So what has changed? Why are we indeed seeing tensions now between China and Taiwan? And I should stress that it is certainly true that there have been more uh, Chinese exercises around Taiwan and more Chinese military moves around Taiwan. And of course, Taiwan itself has been taking an ever stronger position towards China and there does indeed appear to be a growth in pro-independence sentiment in Taiwan. So why has this changed? Well, I'm going to make a simple observation. I think what is uh, the ultimate cause of all of this is not any change within China and not any change either in uh, Chinese objectives or Chinese tactics. Rather, it is the hardening of US policy towards China that has been underway for roughly 12 years now. And this all goes back beyond Donald Trump to 2009, when Barack Obama, who was then recently elected president of the United States, announced the US's pivot to Asia. Note that this happened before Xi Jinping became China's president. Now, this pivot to Asia was not fleshed out in detail at that time, but it was pretty obvious to anybody who followed things closely 
that what Obama and the U.S. administration and the U.S. government were doing at that time was taking the first steps towards containing China, which was coming to be seen increasingly by the United States as a rising challenge. This, after all, was the period just after the financial crash of 2008, when China appeared to be pushing forward economically very fast on the back of a massive reflation program, whereas the United States was struggling with the fallout from the financial crisis. It became possible for the first time at that time to start to see a situation arise where China might one day overtake the United States as the world's leading economic power. So, unsurprisingly, given the self-perception Americans have about their country, it's not perhaps fully surprising that the US from that point on started to take steps in the Pacific region to start to contain China. And at that time, as I so well remember, all sorts of very strange articles, I think at least at the time I thought they were strange, disturbing articles, perhaps more appropriately, uh, started to appear in parts of the US media. I should stress here, this isn't the mainstream popular media that most people read. Rather, it is these uh, fascinating and rather strange uh, uh, media um, um, entities that are produced by various Washington think tanks in which all sorts of strange geopolitical schemes and ideas are floated. Anyway, one of the ideas that was floated at around this time, we're talking about 2009, was of the US fleet imposing a blockade on China by closing the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea. The United States assessed at that time that China was importing most of its oil and raw materials through the South China Sea. It was also trading, exporting its goods via the South China Sea, and that a blockade of China by closing the South China Sea and the Straits of Malacca would put China under intolerable pressure. I thought that was an extraordinary series of articles at the time. I remember noting them and I remember thinking that some people in Washington appeared to have taken leave of their senses. But the fact is that those articles did appear and, of course, they would have been read in Beijing. So, completely unsurprisingly and entirely predictably, the Chinese began to take steps in response. One step, undoubtedly, was a consolidation of the Chinese leadership, and that seems to have centred around the person of Xi Jinping, though I would stress again that, in my opinion, there's been no great break in policy between what Xi Jinping does and what previous Chinese leaders like, uh, uh, Zhao, uh, like uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Tsintao were doing before uh, 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 Xi Jinping became president. But the other things that the Chinese have done since then is that they've taken steps, firstly, to secure their own defences and their control of the South China Sea, and also to develop their own supply lines independent of the South China Sea. So on the one hand, we have seen a massive Chinese naval build-up with China launching an aircraft carrier program, developing missile destroyers, uh, developing a, a powerful submarine force, um, and at the same time, a powerful air force, all of which is clearly focused on the South China Sea and on protecting China's Pacific coastline. Uh, along the way, incidentally, it comes with the development of ground-based ballistic missiles, which are clearly intended to attack 
and if necessary destroy US aircraft carriers operating in the South China Sea against China in a way that might threaten China with that naval blockade that the US, all those articles in the US media back in 2009 and 2010 were talking about. At the same time, the Chinese have taken the other major step, which is their Belt and Road program. This is clearly intended to develop Chinese supply lines so that in the event that there is this great naval blockade of the South China Sea, it will be rendered ineffective and China will be able to continue to receive the natural resources the, uh, that it needs in order to keep its factories and its economy running. So we see the great transport and rail links which China has been building across Eurasia, through Central Asia, to countries like Iran and primarily to Russia. We see China's policy of winning, China, of winning Russia over and the ever closer Russia-Chinese partnership that has developed in consequence. And we see the Chinese also developing their sea routes through Myanmar, uh, um, um, across the Indian Ocean, to try to avoid, if possible, the Straits of Malacca and all that that, uh, that, that concerns. So these are steps which the Chinese have taken in response to that pivot to Asia which Barack Obama announced in 2009. Now, on the topic specifically of Taiwan, it's also the case that the Chinese actions with respect to Taiwan, which the US calls aggressive, are very obviously Chinese responses to US actions especially during the period of the Trump administration, but continuing under the Biden-Harris administration, we have seen the United States taking ever stronger steps to court Taiwan, to develop relations with Taiwan, to treat Taiwan, in effect, as a separate nation from China. We've seen an, up, an uptick in US arms sales to Taiwan, We've seen visits by U.S. officials to Taiwan. One U.S. official who reason, recently visited Taiwan spoke of Taiwan as a nation, implying that it is a separate and distinct nation from China. And we've also seen the United States talk to Taiwan about limiting or preventing the sale of, China, of Taiwanese semiconductors to China's um, electronics industries. So unsurprisingly, seeing all these moves, the, the Chinese have responded again with steps of their own. Some of those undoubtedly are diplomatic and political and to some extent economic, but some of them also have inevitably taken a military dimension. And that is why we're seeing all of these moves of Chinese aircraft and Chinese ships around Taiwan. Every action has an equal and positive reaction. But it is important to stress that it is the United States which is driving this process but through its increasingly confrontational policy to China, which goes back all the way to 2009. So we had firstly the pivot to uh, Asia, which is clearly intended to contain China, and the wild and frankly bizarre talk of blockading China that was uh, uh, appearing in parts of the uh, uh, US media at around that time. And we saw Chinese responses to those steps. And those Chinese responses are then construed in the United States as signs of Chinese aggressiveness, and they then produce more reactions from the US as well. 
And these include, as we have seen, steps to try to draw Taiwan specifically away from China and to bring, to build a regional alliance with various states in the Indo-Pacific region against China. China, in response, then takes further measures of its own and the cycle of action and reaction of confrontation increases and escalates. Now, let's go back to the, that Financial Times article and ask ourselves this question. Is China in a position at the moment to attack Taiwan? The answer is, I don't think so. I don't think the Chinese, at this moment in time, have the military force to take on the US Navy and Taiwan itself at this time. But the time when they might be able to do that is coming closer. China has been involved, engaged in a massive naval build-up. As I said, the reason China launched that naval build-up was because of all that talk in 2009 by the US about blockading China by closing, by, by, by blocking the South China Sea and the Straits of Malacca. But the effect of the Chinese counter to those American steps or threatened steps has been a Chinese naval build-up and a Chinese military build-up which puts China closer to the point where it can plausibly launch a military offensive against Taiwan. That was not the case a decade ago, but it is starting to be the case now. So when US admirals say that in six years' time, with the trend of events in the Pacific taking the shape that they are, with China building up its navy um, um, in the way that it is, that within six years, China may be able to launch an attack on Taiwan. Well, that is probably true. But again, I come back to that essential point. A capability does not translate into an intention. Once it is understood that all of these Chinese moves are essentially reactive, we come back to the fact that Chinese policy for many decades now has been to seek a peaceful reunification between China and Taiwan. China will take military action to bring Taiwan back under, to, under Chinese control if it has to, but that is not its preferred policy. So, the solution to this problem, it seems to me, is actually very clear. It is not to engage China in an arms race along in the South China Sea and along the Chinese coast. Given the reality of China's enormous economic power, especially and primarily its industrial and manufacturing power, that is an arms race which the United States is going to lose. Already, the Chinese Navy, in terms of numbers of ships, exceeds in size the US fleet. Now, the two are not comparable. The Chinese Navy still operates on a far smaller scale than the US Navy does, it doesn't have the global reach that the US Navy does, and it's simply a mis misconception to simply count numbers of ships and say that because the Chinese have more of them, that makes their Navy stronger. Anybody who has any knowledge of military affairs knows that that is not the case, at least not the case now. But in six years' time, it may be different. Ultimately, if you're going to enter into an arms race with a country as industrially developed as China is, on China's own doorstep, then you are setting yourself up for 
failure. The United States cannot outproduce China in ships, missiles, aircraft and submarines in this area along China's coast. This is a race which sooner or later the Chinese are going to win. Given that that is so, that increases much more the prospect of Taiwan becoming drawn into a battle between the US and China in which all the advantages are in China's favour. We are not there yet, but perhaps in six years' time, or perhaps a little later, we will be. So, given that that is so, all this talk by the US of defending Taiwan, of acting in all kinds of ways to protect Taiwan from a Chinese invasion, are misconceived and are actually making the underlying problem far worse. The best solution to this problem is to return to the policy the United States began to follow in the 1970s and which worked very well for a very long time. This is to accept that China and Taiwan are indeed one nation and to allow the Chinese and the Taiwanese between themselves to sort this out. Undoubtedly, there is a hankering with, within Taiwan towards independence, and I accept that there are reasons for that and legitimate reasons for that. But this is not something that should, in the end, concern the United States. I don't think the Chinese, at any point in time, seriously wish for a war between themselves and Taiwan. They're not simply going to march in to Taiwan when they want to, they, because they understand the disastrous effect of doing that, uh, which uh, of doing that would have on their international image. So the Chinese will continue to seek to engage with Taiwan and to draw it into its sphere um, peacefully. And that, I think, is what the United States should let happen. In time, the Taiwanese and the Chinese will sort out their own problems by themselves if left to do so. I would add that if we're talking about Taiwan, one of the reasons for pro-independence sentiment there is surely the fact that many Taiwanese think they can achieve independence because the United States backs them. If that illusion, because that il an illusion is what it is, if that illusion does not exist, then pro-independence sentiment in Taiwan will probably decline and some kind of... Um, effective and successful modus vivendi between Taiwan and China, in which Taiwan accepts that China is ultimately the uh, uh, one country, but a uh, one country with, in Deng Xiaoping's words, two systems, with Taiwan enjoying considerable autonomy, much greater autonomy than Hong Kong ever had, by the way, uh, that that could be achieved, and I am sure the Chinese would be satisfied with it. That is the wise policy to follow. These policies of trying to confront China in its own backyard are bad for the United States, bad for China, and ultimately likely to be disastrous for Taiwan itself. Well, Thank you for listening to me for this, again, long, intricate and very complex uh, 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 programme on this complicated but important subject. I look forward to you joining me in other programmes, both on this channel and on our other channels, the Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforo, 
and also please check out his channel, Alex Christophorou's channel, and our new channel where we show you our interactions with our viewers on our live streams. Please also check out our other platforms, BitChute, Library, Rumble, and especially Odyssey, which we found to be a superb channel, Ple a superb platform. Please also, to the extent that you can, support us via PayPal, um, Patreon, and Subscribestar. And just as to add, we accept payments in all currencies, including the new currencies, Bitcoin, and all that. And last but not least, check out our Discord server and our shop, where you'll find all the wonderful things we have there, our famous magic mugs, our wonderful t-shirts, our hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts, and all the rest. Thank you again for bearing me with me through this long video, and I look forward to you joining me again in future programs on this channel, and please make sure that you check your subscription both to this channel and to all the others. And have a wonderful day, and thank you again.